Hello and welcome to Other Majlis Media Project, which is being realized on the platform of Institute for Development and Diplomacy in ADU University. I'm Anastasia Lavrina and we have a special guest today. It's Neil Watson, British journalist. Neil, hello and welcome. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today, Anastasia. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you, especially after your recent visit to Karabakh. You had a chance to visit Agdam city. Uh, you know, this city was called as a host city before. So being there now after one and a half year after the liberation of the end of the Second Karabakh War, tell us about your impressions, what do you think? Well, it was a real eye-opener. This was my first visit to Azerbaijan uh, since the end of the Second Karabakh War and the first place that I've actually visited that was liberated. And it reminded me very much of what I've seen in photographs and film footage from the First World War. We've got trenches, we've got mine territories, sometimes with three lots of mines that were planted there during the first Karabakh War between 1988 and 1994. We've got ones that were planted by the Armenians when they were setting up as a kind of buffer zone. And then we've got more, much more recent mines that are actually being planted as the Armenians prepared to leave. I believe they had a 15 day extension and they used that opportunity uh, to actually plant even more mines. So we've got mines of lots and lots of different descriptions over the entire territory. It's extremely unsafe. There is not, well, hardly a single building that's actually left intact. And in my understanding, what happened is that the Armenians did their best to destroy as much as humanly possible to make sure that uh, there was no way that the Azerbaijanis could even consider going back. Plus, it was a deterrent to actually stop them going back to any of the other territories that they're actually taken. And then, of course, it, as I say, it was a buffer zone. So they made no attempt to actually use uh, the land itself for their own purposes, to build houses there, to use the agriculture, to maybe use whatever factories or so forth. I understand it was a very rich area in terms of, of produce, of agriculture, uh, before the Second Karabakh, uh, sorry, First Karabakh War. Um, they made no attempt to use any of that because they just were using it as a buffer to stop the Azerbaijanis from trying to retake their territory. So um, it was. Just, I knew it was going to be very bad, but the destruction that I saw was absolutely extraordinary. And to think this happened, you know, comparatively recent times is is just uh, amazing. To think it's actually been left like this for such a long time. Plus, there was things like the desecration of graves that I saw, which uh, you know it doesn't just not just a war crime. It's actually against humanity itself to actually desecrate graves, to go into them, to extract the gold teeth from the bodies, and then to discard the bodies as if they're kind, some kind of refuse afterwards. So the, the actual graveyard that I went into actually has got no graves in it at all. All the bodies have gone. Um, and also they've done the same to the buildings as well. They've been ransacked, they've taken all the wooden carvings, anything, any materials of any value were taken away, either used in Armenia or sold to Iran, I understand. So uh, it was devastation on a level I hadn't really expected and also across such a very wide territory as well. It was a very, very big region. Um, but at the same time, you know, Azerbaijan is dealing with uh, reconstruction almost more than one and a half year already. Yes. Did you have a chance to to see any kind of new technologies being implemented there? Um, to a very limited degree. I think actually building the road that I went on probably has taken an awful lot of time to get it to that point because obviously all that territory had to be demined. But most of it is very, the very... The key uh, element is demining. Yes, yeah. Most, most of it uh, is still very heavily mined before we can even think about um, building any new structures there. I did see a few buildings going up uh, and obviously those areas have been demined. I saw some freshly demined territory as well. And there were a couple of places where we could stop for refreshments and so forth, which obviously have been made safe. But, and there was also seemingly like an, o an oasis in the middle of the destruction. There was what seemed to be a kind of military base um, which is where the military personnel who are looking after the area at the moment, where they can actually live in kind of, of barracks and also where the construction companies that are involved with the reconstruction, they can go there and they can use their facilities as well. But really, you know, there's a very, very long road to travel before reconstruction can even start happening on a wide scale and even further off before people can actually start returning home. You know, you're dealing with the issues related to Azerbaijan to our region since 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. As a British journalist, how do you see the development of the situation in our region at the moment? A lot of protests, 
geopolitics, economy, energy issues, and etc. is being discussed. Yes. We would like to ask your opinion in all. How do you see the situation? It's extremely com it's extremely complex, but also very interconnected. Um, first and foremost, there's the fact that, in my view, the actual ceasefire that we've got at the moment mm -hmm. is a little bit uncertain. The fact is, yes, Azerbaijan got a ceasefire at the end of 2020. It got back its territories, but still a peace deal has not been signed. Um, and then there was the fact that for a long time, for nearly 30 years, the OSC Minutes Group was actually tasked with trying to get a negotiated peace. The, the participants in that were France, United States and Russia, all of which had sizable Armenian uh, diaspora groups living in them. Now, obviously, well, first of all, they achieved absolutely nothing, as far as I understand, for, for the, the entire existence. But then there's also the fact that Russia can no longer be part of the mediation team. Now, the 2020 ceasefire was actually mediated by Russia. They can no longer be part of the picture because of the situation in Ukraine. And now the United States of America itself is not planning to have any issues with Russia and France in order to somehow recreate the work of the Minsk Group OEC, that's why it's more uh, bilateral or unilateral approach in this particular case. Yes, uh, that, this is why I think it's good that the EU seems to have actually stepped into the breach. Uh, and actually there seems to be added momentum now that the EU is kind of playing the negotiating role. Then there's also the fact that Armenia itself is being very, very slow at actually coming towards the peace deal. And that's because of factions within Armenia who are not happy about what's happening. They're clinging on to the remnants of what they thought that they had achieved in the past. So even though Pashinian, although I don't consider him to be a particularly astute politician, he does understand that really the only way forward for his country is to strike some kind of peace deal. He's actually survived his own election, which is a major miracle. Um, and uh, But it, the fact is that he's being held back by some of his people. He's got to be able to sell it to the mass of his population as this is the only way forward. So there's a lot of things holding, uh, holding the situation from going uh, actually to its right direction. But I think the thing that will actually work out eventually is that Pashinian will actually persuade his, his populations to, uh, to actually accept what's happened and also realise that... Uh, actually having a harmonious South Caucasus, including with Azerbaijan, is actually for the greater good of Armenia. Um, and that is because at the moment Armenia is solely reliant on Russia for its infrastructure. It has Russian military bases on its side. It's never really truly got its um, independence. It's had closed borders with Turkey and Azerbaijan because of this conflict. But now it has more possibilities. Exactly. If there are new projects, mm -hmm. it will open the border with Azerbaijan and Turkey. Yes. It will bring more possibilities and perspective for the Armenian people itself. For it, exactly. They, uh, and I think actually the intelligentsia in Armenia did realize this quite a long time ago, that actually the, the, the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh situation had been to the detriment of Armenia itself. I think they will realize that now they can be back part of a bigger uh, South Caucasus, that they can actually work together much better and they can certainly benefit from Azerbaijani energy flows, for example, or transportation links and so forth. We hope that finally they will come to this conclusion. Uh, let's speak a bit uh, broader on the broader issues yes. about the United Kingdom and Azerbaijan. Yes, uh, the relations, bilateral cooperation is developing in quite a sustainable way. But after the conflict is end on post-conflict development, I guess for the United Kingdom, it's also more opportunities for cooperation. For example, in the mining issues, we know that there is a partnership between two sides. Uh, how do you evaluate the perspectives for our uh, bilateral cooperation between two sides? Well, actually, we've just celebrated 30 years of UK-Azerbaijani diplomatic relations. And I would say that the relations between UK and Azerbaijan are the strongest in the world. The fact is that the UK is the, the highest contributor of foreign domestic investment into Azerbaijan. And that's partly down to the machinations of BP and all the related exploration that's happened since the signing of the contract of the century in 1994. Um, and it's very logical that Azerbaijan comes to the UK uh, with regard to these kind of issues, demining issues, defence issues and so forth. Um, it's true that uh, the UK cannot actually supply weapons, but they can actually supply know-how. And they're certainly doing that at the moment. So, um, and also, of course, the UK has been a major contributor to the construction of the Southern Gas Corridor, which has recently come on 
stream and has the potential to deliver up to 30 BCM um, eventually, most of which will go to Southeast Europe, which will definitely help the parts of Europe that are really being affected at the moment by the situation in Ukraine um, and the fact that Russian Gazprom is unable to supply energy to vast swathes of Europe. The, the, obviously, the major thing still is energy, but certainly in terms of agriculture, um, IT and many other sectors, the UK is extremely active. Yeah, and UK is one of the governments, which um, the countries which immediately um, supported Azerbaijan in this peace process development in the region. And we know that the UK ambassador is actively visiting the liberated territories and participating in different projects. So in my opinion, also there are many prospects and uh, possibilities for cooperation to be even a uh, large expand. Exactly. You know, the UK, although it's not a major producing nation these days, um, it's certainly there's a lot of know-how and a lot of technologies in all sectors coming out. And I think there's every intention that this will expand in the future. So we know it's a very important issue. It's about the internal situation in the UK. We know that Boris Johnson survives no confidence voice, which has helped recently. And overall, the situation itself in the UK is not very good with the energy prices and resources prices due to that situation in Ukraine. So my next question will be about how do you see the internal situation in the UK to be developed, the position of Boris Johnson and overall? Yes, I mean, it's it's certainly true that at the moment, uh, the economic situation in the UK is not very strong. Um, energy prices have gone up astronomically. I would say that fuel prices for, for cars have actually doubled over the last few months. And that's all because of the Ukrainian situation. And so when, the thing is, when fuel prices go up, it means that the price of everything goes up. Because in the UK, agriculture is relatively low level. Everything has to come in from mainland Europe. How does it get there? It has to get there by road or by train. Those, those run on fuels. So the fact is that everything has gone up in price because of that. Plus, we live in a relatively cold country. Everybody needs to heat their homes. The price of that, that, that fuel has gone up as well. So a lot of people are actually struggling um, at the moment. And I would say that actually um, the mass of the population do not feel that the government has been dealing with this particularly well because they're not ante anticipated. Just as they're not anticipated COVID from happening, they didn't anticipate the situation in Ukraine to deteriorate so much and that the, the knock-on effect of the fuel price is going up. But the government extent. in the United Kingdom is uh, trying to deal with, to fix these issues. It's trying, and it's trying to do it by, by taxation and so forth, and reducing taxation. But then there's a problem because, you know, the UK, like the rest of the world, hasn't really worked for two years. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, the economy and many businesses have been actually paid out of public funds, so they didn't go into receivership. So... It comes on the back of the COVID situation and, and also the Brexit as well, because the Brexit itself, because certain elements of Brexit in terms of taxation and so forth have not been thought up, thought out properly in advance. That also meant that a lot of goods were going up in price anyway because of that. By the way, I just read the news uh, recently that the United Kingdom is trying to have another um, document or something which will deal with the relations with the European Union rather than that one which was accepted after the Brexit itself. Yes, I think this actually is a common sense approach. They realise that we can't, we can't have another referendum on Brexit, it would be ridiculous, and actually it would look very, very bad for the ruling Conservative Party if that actually happened. But I think they do realise that many elements of the Brexit were not adequately thought out before it went through, which is deplorable, because you know it was going through for two years, and these very basic elements of legislation were not thought out in advance. So that's very bad. But also, as you say, with regard to uh, Boris Johnson, um, there was an issue, I don't know if your viewers are aware of it particularly, but at the very height of the COVID um, situation, the crisis in the UK, when the, there was the lockdown and officially people of the same family were not supposed to be meeting, um, Boris Johnson and the members of the Conservative Party, the ruling party, they actually had parties into which outsiders also were invited. Um, and this came to them, but basically he was breaking his own laws his, and his own advice to actually do this. And that meant that some elements of the ruling Conservative Party felt that uh, there should be a vote of no confidence against him and that he should be ousted and replaced by someone else as the leader of the party and also the prime minister. 
Um, I'm glad to say in many ways that he did actually survive this. Um, I'm not saying he's the best politician we have in the UK, but I do think that he's the most experienced politician and he has been through some crises um, during his premiership. So he did actually survive this, uh, this vote of no confidence. Yes, let's see how the situation will be developed. You know, thank you so much for joining our program today. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Wish you good luck and good health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just to remind you watched Adam Ashley's program and our special guest today is a British journalist Neil Watson. I'm Anastasia Lavrina. Stay with us and see you in the next edition.